The USS Scorpion, one of the first nuclear submarines of the American Navy, vanished in the Atlantic in 1968. What really happened to the USS Scorpion? The whole account of its disappearance is finally being revealed more than 60 years later. Let's run a quick history lesson. In 1960, the Scorpion, a submarine of the Skipjack class, was put into service. It was used largely for reconnaissance and anti-submarine warfare operations. At the time, the submarine was one of the most powerful naval assets in operation since it was outfitted with torpedoes, missiles, and sonar systems. The Mediterranean Mystery and Norfolk's Assignment The defense and security of the United States relied heavily on Naval Station Norfolk. It acted as a focal point for the positioning and management of naval forces in the Mediterranean Sea, Atlantic Ocean, and other key locations. The Norfolk Naval Base offered support and facilities for a variety of naval operations, including maintenance, repair, logistics, and training. At any given time, there were several ships, submarines, planes, and shore-based troops there. The base was home to numerous command centers and facilities, including the Naval Station Norfolk Headquarters, the U.S. Atlantic Fleet, and various operational and support units, and it was a second home to the crew of the ill-fated submarine. The Scorpion left its base at the Naval Station Norfolk, Virginia on May 22, 1968, in preparation for a planned deployment to the Mediterranean Sea. As usual, details of the exact mission are classified like all other operations of the Skipjack-class nuclear submarine. In later days, Petty Officer Dan Rogers of the U.S. Navy admitted that it was strange for the nuclear sub to be silent, especially when the sub was long overdue in reporting to the station. However, Officer Dan Rogers and some other crewmen had earlier reported the poor state of the Scorpion in 1966, which pulled the skipjack into Norfolk's repair yard after a three-month classified operation in the Mediterranean had been completed with reported sightings of Soviet warships and other enemies of the states. The refitting of the sub was meant to take over a year, with major repairs and replacements of some parts expected, but the USS Scorpion was given a substandard overhaul which was detected by the Submarine Safety Program, SubSafe. It was bad enough that the program refused to award the SubSafe certificate to the nuclear submarine as it was faulted in the mechanical and electrical parts that constituted the naval sub. In the speed of seven months after a rushed overhaul, the skipjack was sent into action in late 1967 for weapons testing and a bit of training. Due to some of the mechanical failures, electrical discharge and leakages that the USS Scorpion displayed during its transit back to base in early 1968, Officer Dan Rogers and some crew members disassociated from the vessel after seeing the number of faults and defective metal sheets used for overhauling of the Scorpion. Dan Rogers, who at the time was an electrician's mate on the submarine, requested a transfer and tried to warn them. In his words, I didn't know it was going to sink, but I was absolutely uptight after having been on there and seeing the things I had seen. I was just unable to deal with going to sea again on the Scorpion. At some point during the overhauling, it was rumored that the repair staff was overworked and an acceleration program was put in place by top naval officers to ensure that the USS Scorpion returned to service in 1968. An effort to incapacitate the U.S. enemies? Or rather, an intentional death sentence for the Scorpion and its 99 crew members on board. It was a bad call. En route to Azores, Portugal, with a primary assignment to surveil Soviet warships as well as report enemy ships, the skipjack sent its last message to the nearest substation in Ni Macri, Greece, which was delivered to the Comsoblant, Commander, Submarine Force Atlantic at Norfolk, Virginia. Dead quiet and a presumed attack. Why was it all quiet like ships sailing to the Western Front? Many would kill to have the sudden quietness breezing the desk of Radio Man 2nd Class Mike Hannon. One of the 19 nuclear assault submarines in the Atlantic Fleet, the USS Scorpion, located in Norfolk, was supposed to send a forward check report that, in essence, said, situation normal, proceeding as planned. It was encrypted to prevent the Soviets from intercepting it. The Skipjack-class submarine was on its way back to Norfolk following a three-month deployment to the Mediterranean Sea. Every 24 hours, it was required to send a burst communication that, when decrypted, said, Check 24, Submarine Scorpion. First-hand recount On the morning of May 23, 1968, Radio Men 2nd Class Mike Hannon brisked to his workstation with an unmistakable feeling of apprehension. 
He handles dozens of messages from submarines at sea every day as a communication specialist at Submarine Force Atlantic Headquarters, ranging from routine notifications to top-secret operational transmissions. But when Hannon's eight-hour shift had finished at midnight, hours earlier, he had worried that one of the submarines he was watching would be in trouble, or worse. Its routine was to transmit a daily encrypted check report to indicate a normal situation. However, on the previous day, the expected message did not arrive. Radio Men's Second Class Ken Larbies was briefed about the missing communication before the shift change and when Hannon, the supervisor, inquired if any late word had arrived from the Scorpion the next day, there was none. Hannon was apprehensive of what he would discover when he made the journey from his barracks to the Comsom Blant Message Center on Thursday, May 23rd. They would enter and ascend the stairs to the Message Center on the second floor the lone point of contact between the dozens of nuclear and diesel-electric-powered submarines that were engaged in activities ranging from routine training to top-secret reconnaissance missions at the edge of, and frequently inside, Soviet territorial waters on any given day, which was staffed around the clock seven days a week. Perhaps the last message that came in from the Scorpion to Comsoblant was classified and above Hannon's pay grade, but it became clear that the Skipjack-class nuclear submarine was lost at sea as soon as he stepped into the Norfolk Message Center filled with high-ranking admirals and interlopers. Hannon was still going over what he had said to Ken Larbies the previous day. Both petty officers assumed there must be a neutral explanation for the silence. It wasn't a big concern because boats were frequently running late for a variety of good reasons, from mechanical failures to the radio man just forgot. But the Scorpion was involved in a top-secret scenario and the two radio men were aware of it since it raised the possibility of harm. The submarine had been ordered to travel more than 1,000 miles southwest, down toward the Canary Islands off the coast of Africa, on Friday, May 17, 1968. Its original itinerary called for it to return directly from the Mediterranean to Norfolk. Hushed tones and regimented whispers pierced the air of the Norfolk Message Center, and it suggested a lot to the two petty officers, Hannon and Larbies, who were concerned about the vessel at sea. Was the truth being buried in that room? Is the Scorpion under attack by an enemy warship and the big guns were summoned immediately to strategize and defend the interest of the United States of America? Six days after the disappearance of a nation's asset and strong defense vessel, unofficial information had gone out to various units and quarters about the undue and long silence of the USS Scorpion. May 27, 1968, the Scorpion was scheduled to surface off the Virginia Capes in the late morning and make ship-to-shore radio contact before docking in Norfolk, according to officials at Submarine Squadron 6. The submarine was scheduled to return to Norfolk at 1 p.m. today at the conclusion of a routine extended training operation. In addition to assembling a working team of line handlers to attach the submarine to the pier upon its arrival, the squadron staff had already planned for a harbor tug to be on standby. Several hundred family members had gathered at the base of Pier 22 with banners and balloons to welcome their troops home from sea, despite the strong nor'easter that was battering Southeast Virginia that morning. The official account is uncomplicated and may be found in Navy reports, press releases, and the Court of Inquiries transcript. The seven-year-old submarine failed to show up at 1 p.m. on Monday, May 27th, turning what was supposed to be a normal return from the sea into a serious emergency. The missing submarine story quickly appeared on the top pages of newspapers all around the nation. 110 meters deep or buried forever. The families of the 99 crew on board the submarine trooped into the naval base park with happiness written over their faces as they had been contacted three days earlier about the homecoming of the skipjack class. Unaware of the situation, the families continued to wait on their beloved at the Atlantic Fleet's Anti-Submarine War Force Command. The telephone rang at 2.15 p.m., and the duty officer received jolting news. Submarine Force Atlantic Headquarters was requesting that the Aviation Command immediately launch long-range patrol aircraft from Norfolk and Bermuda to search for any sign of the Scorpion along its expected course in the Western Atlantic. USS Scorpion, SSN 589, has been reported overdue at Norfolk, and now units of the Atlantic Fleet have begun a search by submarine surface ships, and aircraft. It was, however, rumored that the Navy had conducted a secret investigation and searched for the submarine on the third day of its mysterious deadlong silence using underwater acoustic beacons. Acoustic beacons, or pingers, 
were attached to life rafts and other equipment to help locate them using sound waves. These beacons emitted distinct acoustic signals that could be detected by sonar systems, aiding in search and rescue efforts. The Navy received some acoustic sound response in return, which simply gave an account of an underwater explosion. Of course, this was kept secret. On June 7, 1968, the Navy officially declared the USS Scorpion missing and her crew members lost at sea. An official search was then launched to search for the missing submarine. An all-out air, surface, and subsurface search is currently underway in the entire Atlantic Command. While at this crucial time, the Petty Officer Hannon was still in awe of a missing nuclear submarine. Hannon remembered, I encoded and decoded messages sent to higher command and to other ships and subs in rough proximity to Scorpion's last known position. Nevertheless, communications were sent further up the chain of command, asking for advice on how to manage the situation in relation to the media. From there, Hannon saw, with increasing shock and rage, as the Navy attempted to cover up the Scorpion's fate. He was especially furious to learn that on May 24th, Comsublant officials had announced that the Scorpion would arrive at 1 p.m. the following Monday, knowing full well that it had already been lost with all hands. What was worse, three days later, they had said nothing to stop dozens of family members from keeping vigil for hours. Two weeks after that late night, when he had formed Ken Larby's of the submarine's missing check report, Hannah's next shot came on the morning of Thursday, June 6th. Hannon picked up the Virginia Pilot newspaper and discovered that the three-star admiral in charge of Submarine Force Atlantic had testified under oath as the key witness before a formal court of inquiry into the disappearance of the Scorpion the day before. What Hannon and his colleague radio men had seen and heard was completely at odds with the admiral's version. Vice Admiral Arnold F. Shade's sworn declaration made no mention of any of the events in the five days leading up to May other than the late check report and the mob of senior naval officials who had jammed the message center the next morning. Shade gave a detailed account of the Scorpion search and the deployment in the Mediterranean before revealing that Comsoblant had sent Slattery some unspecified exercise instructions after the submarine entered the Atlantic, including a request to report its location on or around Tuesday, May 21st. In the last message from Scorpion, dated May 21st at 7.54 p.m. EDT, Shade claimed that Scorpion gave her position at 8.01 p.m. and reported that she would arrive in Norfolk at 1 p.m. on Monday, May 27th. However, it was almost impossible to question Shade and doubt his credibility as the Admiral was revered and a Navy Cross recipient who participated in 11 submarine missions against the Japanese during World War II and was a combat veteran. He was the ideal first witness in front of the seven-person panel. As a last-minute substitute for the USS Seawolf, the second oldest nuclear submarine in the Navy, which had suffered significant damage in an underwater grounding off the coast of Maine on January 30, 1968, Shade had chosen the USS Scorpion for the Mediterranean. Commander Slatery received critical information from his intelligence division to complete the Scorpion's numerous objectives. Before and after the submarine's three-month deployment with the Sixth Fleet, Shade's operations department was in complete control of it, including the last-minute mission to spy on Soviet vessels off the Canary Islands. Numerous patrol ships and planes from the Atlantic Fleet combed the ocean during the following week. After several days, the search effort was reduced to five destroyers, five submarines, and a fleet oiler moving in two groups south of the Azores toward Norfolk along the Scorpion's last known trajectory. The two groups carefully searched through binoculars, and their radar operators fixedly stared at their scopes for any indication of the missing submarine. The two groups were positioned 12 hours apart for maximum observation. Nothing was discovered. On July 26, 1968, the court submitted its classified report and adjourned. But in late October came the stunning news that the wreckage of the submarine had been found. The Scorpion's shattered hull had been photographed by a camera mounted on an unmanned sled tethered to a three-mile-long cable towed by the research ship USNS Mazar, which for weeks had been searching a 12-square-mile area southwest of the Azores, where officials calculated the wreckage lay on the seabed two miles down. The truth beneath the sea. Mike Hannon and Ken Larbys made the decision to speak out more than 40 years after the USS Scorpion vanished. Hannon and Ken Larbys had uncovered in the anxious hours of May 22nd and 23rd, 1968, the truth behind the missing submarine. Senior officials arrived at the Consumblant Messaging Center, already aware of the Scorpion's loss and its cause. In an interview from 2018, Larbys backed up Hannon's story. 
Hannon reported that officers were openly discussing the fact they thought the Scorpion had been sunk. Additionally, he claimed to have overheard that the Navy's top-secret sound surveillance system, SOSIS, had monitored the Scorpion sinking. He also claimed to have overheard information indicating that the underwater acoustic sensors used to track both submarines and surface ships had been monitoring and tracking the Scorpion before and at its demise, and that it recorded the explosion. He also claimed that a Soviet submarine was tracked leaving the area at a high rate of speed. A Soviet submarine was detected leaving the area at a high rate of speed. The information that Hannon, Larbys, and the other radio operators discovered that fateful Thursday in May 1968, and in the weeks that followed, gives the impression that the Navy's apparent shock and amazement over the missing submarine was a ruse. They support the theory that Scorpion went down during a fight with a Soviet submarine, which was known almost from the moment of its loss by important officials in the submarine force Atlantic. And so that led you to conclude that the Russians did it? Yeah, absolutely. That's my conclusion, and I will believe that until the day I die. It's not the only theory, though. Many people argue for and against the facts available. Some believe that the battery cells of the Mark 37 torpedo on board overheated, leading to a catastrophic explosion and subsequent fire. Seismograph recordings captured two explosions around the time the Scorpion vanished, lending support to this hypothesis. Another theory is that a hydrogen explosion occurred. It argues that charging the batteries caused a release of hydrogen that was then trapped when the watertight doors were shut. It would only take in one spark for the gas to then ignite and explode. And the most popular being a Soviet skirmish. The USS Scorpion was diverted on its way home to observe the activities of a Soviet flotilla. It is possible that this flotilla attacked the submarine and caused it to sink. Several books have been written to support this theory, and it is one that is hard to discount, not least because of the sparse information surrounding the Scorpion's last mission and the fact the Cold War was in full gear. We'll probably never know exactly what happened to the USS Scorpion, but the fatal errors of that day have made sure the United States Navy has not lost a single submarine since that time. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more content. Until next time, this is Fleet Files signing off. See you in the next video.